The Be Rad Podcast is brought to you by MoFo, male optimization formula with organs to boost testosterone. Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece, mind-blowing nut butter blend now available on Amazon. Bala Enzyme, electrolyte and triple enzyme recovery drink mix. Paleo Valley, nutrient-rich ancestral-inspired health products. By Optimizers, performance supplements like magnesium, probiotics, and more. And B-Rad Whey Protein Super Fuel, coming soon. Stay tuned for details. And please visit bradkearns.com to check out my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance with great discounts for listeners. And here we go with the show. You have to go looking for piles of grain foods to establish the foundation of your personal food pyramid. These puzzling illnesses that were quite apparent to be triggered by the consumption of anti-nutrients in plants. Agricultural farming for plant foods is uh, arguably uh, just as bad or similarly bad as uh, raising uh, animals. Hey listeners, I discovered an awesome new electrolyte and triple enzyme powdered drink that's going to knock your socks off. It's called Bala Enzyme, and it comes in a convenient little pouch of bright orange powder that you pour into water for the ultimate electrolyte and antioxidant drink. It's simple, convenient, and yes, the orange tint comes from a potent serving of turmeric along with a clean and diverse assortment of enzymes and electrolytes and a perfect taste that's not fake or too sweet. Bala was created by husband and wife doctors to help their patients recover from inflammation, improve hydration, speed up recovery, even relieve joint pain, improve digestion, and boost immunity. I love their incredible devotion to product quality. There's a lot of research behind it, and I just sprinkle this packet into ice water, and it's so easy to stay hydrated because you absolutely enjoy the taste of the drink. Get their convenient little packets. They even designed it with the uh, the tear half torn so it's easy to open into the water. I love what they think of. And it comes in three exciting flavors, pineapple, lime, and berry. It's so potent, it might stain your fingers if you get it on your fingers. And yes, that's a good thing for a serving of turmeric that's that potent. It's also sugar-free, zero carb, and promoting of the three R's, rehydrate. Relieve and revive. Please visit balaenzyme.com, B A L A E N Z Y M E. And of course, there's a special deal for B Rad Podcast listeners 30% off your first order. Just use the code B R A D 30 at balaenzyme.com. Hi, listeners. Welcome to a part two episode talking about the subject of Brad's diet over the decades and leading us into modern times and my top secret C&C dietary strategy for fat reduction, health, and long-term enjoyment. That C&C stands for carnivore and chocolate. Uh, But in part one, we went through a timeline dating back to my childhood and how I grew up with (laughs) the advent of all these unfortunate dynamics of uh, modern culture, modern society, uh, the advent of processed foods, and the uh, continued escalation of uh, toxic, heavily processed, nutrient-deficient foods into the diet of the human. So I grew up in sync with the rise of fast food culture, especially because I grew up in Southern California where the major fast food chains all originated. And we had the TV dinners and the more convenience and the more stuff that was uh, frozen package wrapped up uh, as compared to the old days and people of a different generation. Dr. Kate Shanahan puts that number at 1950, where if you were born before 1950, you had a great head start in those early formative years of life where you were able to enjoy uh, preponderance of home-cooked meals from fresh natural ingredients. And then after 1950, after we emerged from war times, that's when we started tipping over to TV dinners, fast foods, and more and more processed foods. So uh, I had a lot of uh, junk go into my mouth during my early years of life. But fortunately, we also had a great foundation of healthy home-cooked meals. And that was... um, you know, a real advantage, uh, Dr. Kate explains in further detail in her 
book, Deep Nutrition, that those early years of life and forming a good base of connective tissue throughout the body from getting the right nutrients in your diet can have a tremendous influence on lifelong health. So then I talked about my years as a high school and collegiate athlete, and especially the struggles I had in college and having to turn my attention to dietary habits as I was trying to piece together all the reasons why I kept falling apart, breaking down, getting injured. So I got involved in the early uh, consciousness of athletic-minded diet. Unfortunately, back in those days, in the 80s, um, we were all about the grain-based, high-carbohydrate diet, trying to cut back on your fat intake so you don't get fat, and all those things that have uh, been wonderfully toppled over by emerging science and the great communication that we have uh, continuing to progress and optimize the human diet. Uh, I talk about my introduction into the world of the primal blueprint, thanks to Mark Sisson back in 2008. And that was a cold turkey transition away from a grain-based high-carbohydrate diet to a primal-aligned ancestral-inspired diet. And the primal blueprint food pyramid and the complete list of ancestral foods that fueled human evolution for two and a half million years as a rationale for eating this way. And I'll repeat the list as many times as possible until we all memorize it. And that is meat fish, fowl, eggs, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds. And in the primal blueprint, we go to great lengths to introduce or to welcome certain modern foods that have health benefits and minimal health objections. Uh, one of those would be dark chocolate, and I've taken full advantage of that. Remember, I told you I went cold turkey in 2008 away from uh, the uh, allowable things like frozen yogurt or whatever I was, you know, giving myself a treat with uh, the, um, the the high carbohydrate energy bars and so forth. Uh, so when those left the picture, I had to uh, point to dark chocolate as my one allowable indulgence. And to this day, it's a centerpiece of my diet. It has a lot of health properties, minimal sugar when I'm choosing uh, 80, 85 percent cacao percentage or higher. And so wonderful addition to the diet, uh, even though the caveman uh, didn't uh, know such things. And then also raw, organic, high-fat dairy would be allowable with plenty of health benefits. But again, we won't call that a paleolithic food, so we can have uh, an approved uh, introduction of certain modern foods that don't cause a lot of problems. And as we've evolved the primal blueprint message over the years, we try to be as inclusive as possible. So those interested in transitioning away from the disastrous path that will uh, we will call the standard American diet. Uh, we're trying to do things that are sustainable and enjoyable. So, hey, if you enjoy some uh, well-toasted and buttered sourdough bread once in a while, we're not going to kick you out of the club, uh, but we want to just emphasize that transition from thinking that you have to go looking for piles of grain foods to establish the foundation of your personal food pyramid, as seen with the United States government and their food pyramid that's been out for many decades uh, with grains at the bottom. That's an absolutely uh, flawed notion, and we know that the uh, nutrition is concentrated in the animal products. We're going to talk more about that. So you're going to get most of your nutrition from that aforementioned ancestral list. And you're going to get a lot of foods in daily life that are purely uh, energy. They're purely calories. They don't provide you with a lot of other benefit. And of course, we have plenty of food today for the most part. And so those are the things that you can scrutinize and say, hey, do I really need to pile these giant scoops of rice onto my plate before I serve myself the wonderful avocado curry from the Thai restaurant or wherever the uh, the true nutrition and the true enjoyment is coming uh, from the the foods and the meals in your diet. Okay, so um, I talked about the primal and then I ended the last show with that little uh, revision or escalation in my commitment to ancestral eating uh, where we re refined it to the ketogenic diet because Mark Sisson and I put out that book in 2017, The Keto Reset Diet, uh, one of the earliest and still best-selling books on the subject. I think it is the uh, a wonderful way to acquaint yourself with the benefits of ketogenic eating, learn all about how the body works, and then use it as a tool uh, occasionally or perhaps more frequently to do things like drop excess body fat, 
or to get these ketones produced and help give your brain uh, a cleaner burning fuel source. There's wonderful benefits uh, to be experienced, but it's not intended to be, in my opinion, a long-term strategy that you must adhere to uh, for years and decades, um, carefully cutting off your carbohydrate intake at 50 grams per day or below. So that brings us to the subject of part two and the significant dietary revision that I was compelled to make in early 2019. And I'm going to pinpoint uh, a podcast that launched in May of 2019 when I heard for the first time Dr. Paul Saladino speak so passionately and eloquently about this carnivore dietary strategy with none other than one of the smartest guys out there, Dr. Ben Greenfield. Just kidding. He's not a doctor, but he might as well be because he is the go-to source and uh, just the wealth of knowledge that he has about all things diet, fitness, uh, is just stunning when you listen to his shows and the amount of uh, work he put into his gigantic uh, best-selling books, Beyond Training and Boundless. So we have two very, very smart, well-informed guys talking very responsibly, referencing science left and right, and uh, it seemed like uh, Saladino pretty much blew Ben Greenfield's mind in the same manner that he blew my mind as a listener, because he was presenting this case that the foods of the plant kingdom uh, virtually all contain these natural toxic substances uh, called antigens or anti-nutrients, and they are designed to ward off uh, pests, predators that will uh, consume the plant. The plant does not want to be consumed. Its job is to evolve and reproduce. And so these natural plant toxins that we're all familiar with, that were all acknowledged by uh, by science, and it's not, it's not in dispute, um, but you don't need to eat these things because they can cause problems in many people, especially those uh, sensitive with things like leaky gut or any form of chronic autoimmune or inflammatory conditions that haven't been uh, well addressed by uh, traditional medical treatment. So people with arthritis, asthma, allergies, all these things that we live with and deal with and struggle with and suffer with and think they're normal could be <laughs> traced to your consumption of that wonderful, incredibly healthy green smoothie that you drink every morning or that salad that you have at midday or the steamed vegetables that you have in the evening. Uh, so this was a complete eye-opener to me. I learned some basic science that I was tremendously embarrassed that I didn't realize. Um, for example, uh, when you grab that handful of blueberries and shove them down your throat, thinking that you're getting a dose of potent antioxidants, what you're really getting is a food that signals for internal antioxidant production. And so what you're really getting with the blueberry and the other quote-unquote high antioxidant foods are pro-oxidants, things that cause oxidative stress in the body due to the aforementioned anti-nutrients. And so when you consume a blueberry, your body responds with an antioxidant defense response. So the liver manufactures an internal source of antioxidants, and that's where you get the food benefit from. It's not directly from the blueberry. I was like, wait a second, are you serious? And I had to learn it over and over and email Paul follow-up. I got him on my show. It was a fantastic show. He's been on three times, so please go back and listen to those shows with Dr. Paul Saladino. You will be strongly convinced to check some of your fixed and rigid beliefs and challenge this notion that we need to go looking for this incredible variety of plant foods in order to be a healthy human. And of course, this had me uh, back on my heels with my head spinning because we spent a lot of time and energy in the Primal Blueprint series of books and everything else I've written to say, look, the, uh, the vegetables, the wonderful plants of the world should be the bulk of your dietary emphasis and you should get plenty of these and make big piles of steamed vegetables and enjoy those or have a giant salad I mean, Mark Sisson became famous for his big ass salad and uh, had it the as the centerpiece of uh, his Primal Kitchen enterprise. And then, oh man, um, I got Paul and Mark together. I said, Mark, you got to meet this guy. And uh, Paul drove down uh, from Washington State uh, to Los Angeles en route for his first uh, major move. He's been moving around. Now he ended up in Costa Rica. Uh, but back then he was moving from Seattle to San Diego to get more surfing in and 
launch his career as a health expert. Uh, so we had a, a pit stop in, in L.A., had a nice night at my house. He cut me up some raw liver in the morning, heavily salted, frozen raw liver. I enjoyed it, and it's become a, a, a dietary practice to this day. Um, and then uh, when, when he sat down with Sisson, uh, he pretty much shook up his mind, too, and was got him in a corner and was, uh, you know, interrogating him. Why do you need to eat that salad? Go ahead. Tell me. Uh, after what we've discussed today and how the majority of the nutrients are in the animal foods, and Mark was uh, stammering at one point going, uh, uh, well, I like the, the, the chewy texture of the vegetables. <laughs> and we're all like, wow. It was like uh, the smoke was clearing after these interviews that I conducted with Paul uh, that Mark and Paul conducted, and I was there to enjoy with our cameraman, Brian McAndrew, another huge eating enthusiast that was forced to uh, uh, reconsider a lot of his notions. And of course, Brian and I got together with William Schufelt and wrote the epic, uh, wonderfully uh, crafted book called Carnivore Cooking for Cool Dudes, because we all had been captivated by the carnivore movement and were looking for interesting, fun recipes that were carnivore-ish. Uh, so anyway, all this is happening in 2019, and the carnivore diet is emerging as a legitimate strategy, especially for people who are suffering this, with these puzzling illnesses that were uh, quite apparent to be triggered by the consumption of anti-nutrients in plants. And this is very, very personal. Uh, so some people have no problem chowing down the salad every day or having the wonderful green smoothie with all kinds of raw vegetables. And that was a practice I was dabbling in uh, prior to 2019. So I'd cut up and freeze these big bags of uh, chopped up kale, celery, beets, spinach going in these giant Ziploc bags. I'd get them out. And when you freeze them, oh, of course they last for a while. And they also kind of make the smoothie nice and cold. So I'd, I'd stuff my giant uh, Vitamix blender full of these uh, wonderful uh, nutrient dense foods inspired by a great video by Dr. Rhonda Patrick on YouTube, where she's making her own green smoothie and she's uh, sticking a bunch in, blending it up and then sticking more in top secret. So you can get more of this stuff into a single uh, pitcher of smoothie and uh, talking about the amazing benefits of uh, these these molecules like sulforaphane, which is found in broccoli seeds, and it's the, the most potent antioxidant. And I'm like, well, I want to be as healthy as possible. I better chow down all this stuff. And so I would add uh, protein powder and uh, whatever, uh, you know, almond milk, coconut milk, something in there, and uh, drink up these big green drinks every day. And guess what happened every single day? Uh, for wh however long I was doing this, uh, a couple of years where I was trying to do this with devotion, uh, my stomach would expand. It would bloat out and it would stick out that way for several hours. I'd say three to four hours. Every time I downed one of those green smoothies, I'd walk around with a bloated stomach and sometimes I'd experience these transient sharp pains, like just walking through the house, turning a corner, and boom, my stomach would kind of light up, and then it would go away, but it would still be puffed out, and I'd have an assortment of uh, complaints related to digestion and elimination. I thought these were all normal. I also made giant piles of stir-fry, and boy, when like I was cooking for family get-togethers, I would just open up the bags you know, from Trader Joe's and just keep cooking multiple bags of spinach and kale and uh, red peppers and yellow peppers and green peppers and uh, make these uh, delicious dietary centerpieces every day, just shoving that stuff down. I was especially fond of purple cabbage. So I'd cut up the purple cabbage and stir fry that, uh, add some spinach leaves, a lot of spinach leaves, excuse me, and then everything reduces down when you're stir frying it right. So um, the, the, the amount of raw vegetables that I was eating in the smoothie and then cooked vegetables in the stir fry, and then of course giant salads uh, as a daily centerpiece uh, featuring a, a protein source like fish or steak or something, uh, a lot of uh, oil-based dressing, the healthy Primal Kitchen line, or just putting my own olive oil on it with lemon juice and consuming these things. So I had this kind of plant-heavy, bulky diet uh, for many, many years, believing this was the epitome of health practice. Uh, and I also had 
uh, like I said, uh, an assortment of minor uh, complaints or conditions relating to digestion and elimination. Uh, I think my whole athletic life, I've had a connection between uh, high-intensity, high-impact workouts, like a sprint workout, jumping workout, and leaky pipes. So uh, they have the the association of uh, needing to visit the toilet in the aftermath of these tough workouts. And of course, that's from all the pounding that the digestive tract takes when you're really pushing it out there. Well, guess what it also is from? I believe it was from the widespread inclusion of these uh, sensitive foods into my diet, the uh, the toxins contained in plants. There's all kinds of terms for them. Paul Saladino can rattle those off like nobody's business. And I encourage you to go back and listen to our shows for a comprehensive coverage. But I will uh, jump in here with a quick overview of what we're talking about and try to set the proper perspective. So these plant toxins are all kinds of different uh, chemicals, proteins, and acids which have the potential to damage our very delicate digestive tract, especially the gut lining, uh, cause inflammation of the gut lining, which leads to leaky gut syndrome, which leads to a variety of autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, and also hormone imbalances and can even affect uh, the delicate uh, firing of the neurotransmitters. So uh, in general, as Paul likes to repeat frequently, here's what you want to avoid. These are the most toxic foods in the plant kingdom, the categories of roots, leaves, stems and seeds, because this is the uh, the life force of the plant, the most important thing to protect. In contrast to, for example, uh, the fruit of a plant, the plant is offering the fruit to you because that's part of its evolution and survival. The plant wants you to consume its fruit, and then the uh, that who consumes it will go and poop it out somewhere else and uh, spread the seeds of the plant. This is all basic biology, people. Um, the plant wants you to eat the fruit, but it desperately wants to protect the, the roots, leaves, stems, and seeds. Otherwise, the plant will be gone if you pull it out of the ground or what have you. And so that's where the highest concentration of plant toxins are located. Uh, in uh, practical terms, this means that you're going to want to uh, have high alert for the food categories of grains, legumes, leafy greens, nuts, and seeds. Oh my goodness, that includes Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece. Wow. Uh, But the uh, leafy green family, also a big shocker because those are widely recognized to be the most nutritious of all the foods in the plant kingdom. Oh boy. Um, There's all kinds of different plant toxins uh, floating around in these foods. And again, uh, many of them trigger an antioxidant defense response in the body, which is where the plant gets lauded for its health benefits. And so it's all a balance here. And I don't want you to walk away shaking your head, especially when you hear a really enthusiastic presentation of how um, everyone uh, should never eat plants again. And then it's really confusing. And so we don't want to go overboard in either direction. Uh, Same with the vegans saying that uh, all manner of animal foods are evil and ruining the planet, and um, we have tremendous evidence uh, to show that uh, statements, blanket statements like these are incredibly irresponsible, and agricultural farming for plant foods is uh, arguably uh, just as bad or similarly bad as uh, raising uh, animals, and of course we can all agree that factory farming is pretty disastrous for the planet, uh, but when animals are raised in a sustainable manner, they represent the most nutritious foods on earth. That's very, very difficult to dispute by anyone, even someone in the vegan camp. If you look um, at a nutrient analysis of a slice of liver versus a stock of broccoli, um, there's no comparison. Okay, so that was an aside, but back to this uh, discussion of um, considering the idea of at least experimenting with the exclusion of the most toxic plant foods and determining if you have any improvement in symptoms, even mild symptoms, because most of this, for most people, is subclinical. Uh, And one statement that Paul made on on one of our shows is like, hey, we're just talking about trying to optimize and perhaps move you from level 7 to level 9. And it's an interesting concept because how, who are we to judge um, what level we're at? We all have only, the only reference point we have is ourselves, right? So um, 
I might think I'm at level nine, but I'm really only at level seven because I eat a salad every day. <laughs> Shake my head. What are you talking about? Or because my green smoothie is bringing me down from potentially level nine to level seven when I think it's bringing me up from level seven to level nine. You get what I mean? So we have to test and experiment and maintain an open mind and think critically about all these concepts. And that's why the carnivore the message uh, was so resonant to me. It's like, wow, I, I have to take a look at this. Um, some of the anti-nutrients contained in plant foods. Lectins is probably the most prominent, and gluten is the most common and most known form of lectin. This is widely recognized to cause all kinds of havoc in the body for especially the sensitive people, right? The, the celiac and the people that are highly sensitive will have an adverse event as soon as they take a slice of pizza or a slice of bread. Uh, but gluten is pretty much uh, a toxin to everyone, and it's very difficult to digest even those who are mildly sensitive and never notice anything. Uh, we're all sensitive at some level, and it has the potential to inflame the digestive tract and trigger an autoimmune response in the body for consuming this uh, agent that we have not uh, adapted, evolved to digest successfully. There's also a category called phytic acid or phytates, and these phytates bind minerals in the digestive tract and inhibit their absorption. So it's kind of like consuming too much fiber. Uh, you get too much phytic acid and thereby strip yourself of the potential of, of uh, ingesting these minerals and absorbing them. Um, we have soy and also flax foods, which are widely consumed and widely touted as healthy, but they're 200 times more estrogenic than any other food category. And so they have the potential to throw off your uh, sex hormones. Um, oxalates is another big category. Uh, these can um, bind with minerals again. So inhibiting your nutrient absorption because you are consuming these plant toxins. Uh, the oxalates also have the potential to stress the kidneys. They're blamed for kidney stones and they're found in high levels in things like nuts, spinach, baked potatoes, rhubarb, beets. I think dark chocolate is on the list, high in oxalates. We have something called glycoalkaloids. These can be neurotoxin enzyme inhibitors adversely impacting the function of your nervous system and your neurotransmitters. They are found in high levels in things like potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. Uh, you may be familiar with the FODMAP diet, and that is a, an exclusion diet uh, for people suffering from uh, mysterious conditions where they have a, a strict list of things to avoid uh, with potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, the nightshade family prominent on that FODMAP list. Uh, we have sulforaphane. That is the exact molecule that you can hear Rhonda Patrick uh, go off and extol the many uh, amazing antioxidant benefits, but it can also, and this is again, when it's out of balance, consumed to excess or consumed by someone uh, particularly sensitive, to uh, con ingesting these leafy greens. Sulforaphane can inhibit your internal antioxidant system and thereby promote cell death, apoptosis, and other adverse cellular uh, reactions because you are out of balance or not processing this agent successfully. So a little bit of poison has a positive effect. It causes the anti -re antioxidant response in the body and too much of it too frequently, or if you're too sensitive, or especially if you have have an existing condition of leaky gut, you're going to be vulnerable and sensitive to all manner of plant toxins. And that's where you hear these people uh, go and get their uh, report, uh, a stool report or whatever it comes from, and they have a list of 27 things they're uh, allergic to or what have you that just indicates or suggests an unhealthy gut like lining and an increased sensitivity to all manner of plant toxins. But sulforaphane is high in the leafy green family. So the, uh, the nutrient superstars of the plant kingdom can also turn against you and be the worst offenders. That would be things like kale, broccoli, uh, cauliflower, radishes, Brussels sprouts, arugula, 
Uh, there's another thing called isothiocyanates. What these do is compete with iodine in the cells so they can cause problems with thyroid. And you have a lot of uh, reformed uh, vegetarian vegan eaters talking about how they just trash their thyroid because they were consuming mass quantities of these leafy greens that are the centerpiece of a plant-based diet. Uh, but again, some people can thrive and they can get on podcasts and YouTube and talk about how wonderful they feel with all these leafy greens into their life and other people this can be secretly bringing you down um, there's more categories things like tannins photosensitizers salicylates flavonoids cyanogenic glycosides yes that's right they make cyanide in certain circumstances uh, in certain cell functions and so uh, as a group in general I'm going to contend that most people are uh, subclinical with their reactivity to plant toxins, meaning that they're not rushing off to the doctor and feeling horrible and feeling diseased because they're eating salads or stir fries. Uh, but that's my, uh, my takeaway point here is you deserve to try a 30 day experiment where you restrict virtually all plant foods if you're game or at least restrict the most toxic plant foods from those categories of roots, leaves, stems, and seeds. So uh, fruit, honey, the least offensive plant foods can probably stick around. Uh, it's very rare that people are highly sensitive to things like avocado, um, honey, and the fruit, and other uh, acceptable plant foods. But whatever kind of experiment you're inclined to do, see how it goes. And of course, I'm uh, fond of going all in on my health practices, my fitness endeavors. And so I tried, of course, the extreme uh, carnivore restrictive diet uh, as soon as I was uh, awakened to this um, amazing movement. And it, again, uh, because I was a healthy guy, I wasn't suffering from any acute health conditions. I did not have leaky gut syndrome. I didn't have this amazing health awakening where all of a sudden all these terrible things went away. Uh, but I did have a quieting of my digestion and elimination. In other words, nothing to report rather than, oh yes, I get leaky pipes after hard workouts. Oh yes, I get a bloated stomach for three to four hours after consuming a green smoothie. So that was a tremendous awakening to realize the absence of symptoms rather than uh, getting on the podcast, firing up the mic and saying, I feel better than ever. I'm amazing. I have incredible stamina. <laughs> uh, it's all because I, I kicked out the, uh, the plant foods. It was more like, hey, some optimization occurred and I jumped up from level seven to level eight in the most amazing and unthinkable way possible uh, by putting away all those colors and all the things that we've been touting for so long as the centerpiece of the healthy diet. I want to tell you about ShipStation. If you have an online business, shipping can be the craziest and most stressful part. I know we're always trying to optimize our shipping for direct orders of Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece or the B-Rad Whey Protein Superfuel. And with ShipStation, you never have to worry about shipping again. Make the switch to a solution that handles all of your shipping needs quickly, affordably, and painlessly. The best part is time saving by funneling all of your orders into one simple interface no matter where you're selling amazon ebay etsy or your own website everything is coordinated so nicely no more headaches from dealing with returns and return tracking ship station makes everything easy you also reduce error and increase automation with their excellent user-friendly software and this is great. You can save money by comparing carrier options and choosing the best shipping option every time automatically. This is huge because what we typically do is have to log in to three different providers to see who ships cheaper to this place or that place. Ridiculous waste of time. ShipStation, super awesome. It works with every carrier. You always find the best fit and your business can access the same discounted rates usually reserved for the large companies. So here we go. I want you to try this out if you have an online business. 
business. Just go to ShipStation.com and use my offer code BRAD to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free with no hassle, stress-free shipping. I'm so glad I found this partner. Just go to ShipStation.com slash BRAD and make ship happen. And oh my goodness, I should also report on the effect it had on my brain. Because once I was convinced, well, or once I was open to the possibility that the salad was not the king of the universe for Brad Kearns and for many others that I communicate with, that the stir fry was not an absolutely essential element of me being the healthiest guy I possibly could, uh, I started to lose my appetite for them. And I'd look at the broccoli uh, that was just served to me, and I, I couldn't bring myself to eat it because I suspected that it might not be uh, the, 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 the king ruler of the universe that I, that I considered it to be and that it could quite possibly be doing me harm. Oh my gosh, I threw the bags of frozen vegetables away uh, so quickly and um, you know never had that bloated stomach again from the big smoothie. And of course, I'll never go near a green smoothie for the rest of my life because the awakening has been so uh, abrupt and striking. And so I have not been able to bring myself to consume a salad since early 2000. 2019, when previously I would report to anyone who wanted to listen how delicious and fantastic my super duper deluxe salads were. Now I'm thinking back to these amazing salads where um, probably the most enjoyment came from the protein source that was on there, right? So a salmon salad tastes great largely because it is imbued with delicious salmon or a steak salad. Uh, it also doesn't hurt to have those wonderful dressings on there that have so much taste because of the savory nature, the high fat nature of the salad dressing. And of course, I would be liberal with sprinkling uh, nuts and seeds on there and things that had uh, more intense, flavorful enjoyment than the piles of vegetables. And yet the crunchy texture of chewing those uh, red peppers is nice. Uh, but boy, you should have seen the look on Mark's face. You can look at it on YouTube when he was backed into that corner and trying to advocate and defend his consumption of the salad. So haven't had a salad, haven't had any stir fry. I have had very few vegetables of any kind in the last few years, uh, just because my brain has been uh, captured and uh, uh, brainwashed by the, the carnivore leaders. Had a great show with uh, Dr. Sean Baker. Highly trained, highly intelligent folks here, the leaders of the movement. And boy, um, the least you could do is give them a listen and, and try for yourself. And Sean Baker's approach is more um, a, a bulldozer than, than the nuanced approach of Saladino. And he's a guy who's heading over to Costco, looking at the specials on the ribeyes and the burgers and eating pounds of meat every single day. He's not going out of his way to go nose to tail or too worried about um, the little peculiarities of which plant foods he should allow back into the picture. But what's interesting about Sean, besides his uh, deep medical background and vast knowledge of health, is that he is uh, breaking world records uh, in his uh, in his 50s. So another role model and a cohort for me to, to look to for inspiration. Uh, he's setting world records in the Concept 2 rowing and performing at a high level, uh, you know, looking very strong and ripped and healthy. And so something he's doing is working. He has great articles on his website and on his podcast about how even a rudimentary approach to the carnivore diet has helped him to thrive and feel fantastic. Okay, all this to say that I have drifted into what I would call a carnivore-ish, animal-based, animal-heavy diet rather than a plant-heavy diet uh, as followed previously for many years. And I feel uh, probably the, the best attribute is the nutrient density of my diet. And so I'm going to put that up there as the number one goal that I personally have and that I personally recommend is to maximize the nutrient density of the calories that you consume. Of course, you want to enjoy yourself and uh, to feel like something that you can uh, sustain for years and decades ahead. And when you have the most nutrient density, oh my gosh, of course it's sustainable because it is enjoyable and satisfying at that deep cellular and psychological level where you're getting what you need to thrive. So for example, probably most 
most people can raise their hand and contend that uh, when you're served a delicious omelet, it's highly nutritious and satisfying because of all the the nutrient density in that food versus a, a bowl of plain oatmeal has less nutrient density and less dietary satisfaction accordingly. Oh, yes, that's right. You have to add brown sugar to it to <laughs> increase the satisfaction level, but not so with an omelet or a delicious steak or the true superfoods of the earth and the carnivore scores food rankings chart. I did an entire show just covering the chart that was made uh, with my uh, my sidekick in that project, Kate Kretzinger. And uh, I look at that all the time. I inspire you to uh, print it down off uh, bradkearns.com. You can download it off the website, print it out, and and uh, put it on your refrigerator for a glance because we tried to rank in a tiered fashion the most nutrient-dense foods on earth. And that's the things that you can strive to emphasize to get your diet to uh, the A, you know, A plus level. So trip out on this, Kate's ingenious graphic here on the carnivore scores food rankings chart called the steak line and you strive to eat most of your foods above the steak line so it's a delineation line where below it are the foods that are lower ranked on nutrient density and above it are the superstars starting in the top category the global all-stars and in that top list grass-fed liver oysters salmon eggs and caviar so these are the true superstars with the most nutrient density uh, highlighting with liver which across the board nutritional profile uh, blows any other food away. Um, we have grass-fed steak and things up there above the steak line and down below chicken, turkey, and pork. That's an amazing uh, recent insight that I've come to understand further and appreciate further. Uh, but when we have the typical uh, mass-produced factory animal that we uh, have as the majority of what we can consume unless we're working really hard to source uh, the most sustainable animals, um, the chicken and the turkey and the pig uh, take it worse than the, the cow. The cow is a ruminant animal with numerous stomachs, as are the other uh, sources of red meat, things like buffalo, bison, elk, lamb, venison. And so they can process this crappy junk food grain-fed diet uh, much more efficiently and deliver a superior end product with the fatty acid profile in the meat, what I'm talking about, than a chicken, uh, a turkey, or a pig. And the chicken's life is so disastrous. And if you're worried about animal cruelty, um, they have a much worse life than a cow who all cows spend about 80% of their lifetime out there grazing and grass fed, roaming around. Then uh, most cows get ushered into the feedlot for the final months of their life and they gain hundreds of pounds in just a few months chowing on that feed. If you're driving on Interstate 5 in California, you will see them with their faces stuck into the trough and just chowing down and walking around in cramped quarters and, oh, it's so sad, look at that terrible life the cows have. Yes, indeed, for the final months of their life in the feedlot. Uh, but the chicken is in a cage uh, day and night with the lights on typically in these mass-produced uh, chicken facilities because the chicken doesn't sleep when, they, when the lights are on. Uh, they're shot up with hormones, pesticides, and antibiotics so they don't get sick and die in these cramped, filthy quarters. The hormones make them grow faster so they can get to market faster. So these artificially inflated... Uh, 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 fleshy chickens that didn't exercise. They were stuck in the cage their whole life, eating feed. They never had a chance to roam on the pasture. Um, boy, that's a vastly inferior choice with much more pain and suffering inflicted if you're going for that scoreboard. Think about this. Uh, I might have these stats wrong, but the, the average person eats uh, beef at a rate of consuming one cow every couple of years, right? It takes a long time to eat a cow. Anyone who's uh, gone in on a cow share, I did that with my neighbors years ago where I bought a quarter of a cow for, I don't know what it was, a couple few hundred bucks. And oh my gosh, the amount of meat, it was stuffed full in the freezer for many months. It took a lot of months just to get through a quarter of a cow. Uh, a chicken, we eat at a rate of one every two weeks or something average, right? I mean, you can get a bird uh, from the rotisserie at, at Costco or at the supermarket and eat it in a day or two. To. So that means more chickens are suffering and dying uh, to feed you rather than sacrificing one cow every couple of years. So uh, a huge vote in favor of red meat to be ranked above what many people widely uh, blather as a, a, a dietary improvement when they say, oh, yeah, I've cut out red meat and I eat a lot of chicken and fish. Well, uh, look at the fish scoreboard, too, at places like 
uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium or Seafood Watch. Uh, we'll put those links in the show notes uh, where a, a significant percentage of fish are uh, not recommended highly due to concerns about their raising, their sustainability, and their nutrient profile. For example, salmon, which I believe it's 90% of all salmon on the market are farm-raised. Uh, it's the number two most consumed fish behind tuna. And a lot of that tuna in the can uh, might have an adverse ranking due to sustainability. So you want to get that line caught tuna and look on the uh, on the jar for signs that the company is concerned about the environment and sustainability. Uh, there's a lot of good brands out there proudly touting that their tuna is uh, harvested uh, gracefully. Uh, but the salmon, 90% of the salmon in these very crowded salmon farms, uh, the species is called Atlantic. So it's Atlantic salmon is mostly what we're seeing in the restaurants and in the stores. And Atlantic, it does refer to an ocean on the globe, but it's just the species of salmon. So it's not necessarily caught wild in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, a lot of waiters and waitresses, if you're listening, uh, please add that to your uh, your content list because a lot of times they're um, misinformed and I ask them if it's wild caught and they say, yes, it's Atlantic. I'm like, oh boy, okay. Uh, so the wild caught salmon will come from the Pacific and there's several species, king, coho, and others that you can find, uh, you know, up harvested in Alaska and uh, shipped at a pretty affordable price if it's previously frozen and then uh, fresh found at uh, the Trader Joe's has great selection. Costco uh, also, if you're in the United States listening. Uh, but anyway, you can get wild caught salmon also in a can if you're worried about affordability. So it's a very high quality nutritional product, high ranking, uh, but inexpensive. And so we're trying to stay away from the farm salmon, but again, uh, scrutinize further. That's what the, the rankings is all about. And I won't go deeper into the list because I did a whole show about it, but trying to prioritize that is a huge thing for me. And it it's enhanced my appreciation and enjoyment of my diet so much to focus on nutrient density and thereby uh, questioning the need of uh, preparing this big giant salad in the name of health. Uh, so by this point, you probably have formed an opinion about an animal-based diet uh, versus all the propaganda telling us that the, the plant-based are the healthiest and most uh, eco-friendly consumers. Uh, but whatever you want to say about it, I will also put in a plug for the uh, carnivore-ish eating strategy as the single most effective for fat reduction. So if you're frustrated with prior attempts to drop excess body fat, you've tried whatever, uh, we know how uh, futile it is to try to increase your exercise output and drop excess body fat because we simply eat more calories and make other compensations in our metabolic and hormonal function to kind of adjust and, and get drift, drifted back toward our set point. And then if you've tried on the diet side, uh, things like carb restriction, keto, a plant-based approach, it can also be difficult to sustain. But when you are going for fat reduction and you attempt the carnivore strategy where you're going to focus for 30 days or however long on all animal foods, only animal foods, or almost all animal foods, what's going to happen is you're going to feel incredibly satisfied satiated at every meal, right? You're going to have your four eggs for breakfast or whatever you want. Uh, you're going to have uh, big steaks. You're going to have ground beef. Uh, you're going to have fish and you're going to have these great meals where you're completely satisfied. You don't feel like eating more. You don't feel deprived. And you're also going to have extremely minimal uh, insulin production and uh, glucose spikes, which are a prominent cause of uh, increased appetite. And so that winning combination is going to unlock your body fat from storage uh, to burn off, provided you create that uh, caloric deficit. And that can happen naturally and gracefully because there's only so many steaks you can eat. And at a certain point, you're going to feel like, hey, I've had enough for dinner. And so the success, the predicted success is much better when you're feeling satisfied from your meals. You're not producing a lot of insulin. You're unlocking or you're upregulating insulin's counter regulatory hormone, which is called glucagon. And glucagon, not glycogen, but glucagon is what releases 
energy from storage and liberates it into the bloodstream. So it's taking the storage form of fat, which is triglycerides, and dumping it into the bloodstream as free fatty acids to burn. So you feel stable mood, energy, appetite, and you're eating these wonderful, delicious meals. You can handle it for a sustained period. You're not going to, uh, you know, drift uh, back over into the ice cream pints because you're doing something silly like restricting calories. Because again, if we do a systematic restriction of calories, but we still produce a a requisite amount of insulin because we're consuming uh, a, a significant percentage of carbs in this restricted calorie diet. What's going to happen is we're going to be freaking hungry all the time and the dials are all going to turn down from 11 or 10 or whatever they're on down to 7 or 6 or 5. So you're going to be feeling tired, sluggish. You're not going to work want to work out as much. Uh, you might feel colder temperatures. I know even at times when I do extended fasting, I detect that my body temperature is a little low. I feel a little cold uh, just walking around in the afternoon if I haven't had my uh, delicious morning smoothie or midday meal. And that happens once in a while, and I contend that might be um, some thyroid and some other functions turning down a little bit due to the combination of lack of calories and especially and when I performed a high-intensity workout uh, during that day. So um, that's a good sign for me to go and get nourished, even if I'm not hungry, right? So this is uh, another plug for the animal carnivore-ish diet if you're interested in that very prominent goal of fat loss. And I contend that that's really uh, the centerpiece of what enabled me to drop eight pounds of excess body fat in exactly three months it was. Uh, I did a whole show on that, the Fatty Popcorn Boy Saga, and it was no trouble. Uh, it was just the... Um, combination of putting this arbitrary restriction in of not consuming any calories until noon. And again, I did that to enjoy and appreciate the benefits of fasting, but also just to have a rule in place. So departing from a uh, free pass to have unregulated caloric intake, including uh, a greater variety of foods than just saying, look, I'm going to focus on uh, this carnivore-ish strategy. And the ish stands for things like uh, avocados, uh, maybe the mini corn tortillas that go beneath a large pile of eggs or steak. So it wasn't uh, incredibly strict and restrictive. And I only... Uh, would uh, recommend that uh, highly for people who have autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. So if you, you restrict all plant intake for 30 days, you can discern changes in your nagging conditions, and then you can start to add back. And so you might think, hey, uh, maybe I'll try a sweet potato and see if I react to that. And the super, super sensitive folks will find, uh, will, will come to this list of approved foods that they can have. It might be kind of small, and other people might find that they really don't have any trouble digesting anything. And I would say that I'm in that category of pretty, um, pretty adaptable, but again, not to the extent of going and preparing this huge, super duper green smoothie where I get massive doses of oxalates and all the other uh, fancy sounding stuff that I talked about that can cause problems, including gas bloat transient digestive pain and elimination difficulties. Oh, and so it's no picnic to uh, follow a highly restrictive diet, even for a short time. And so I allowed dark chocolate to hang around so that I wouldn't trip out about how difficult my uh, journey was and how strict I was to only eat uh, carnivore or carnivore-ish meals. And so that's why I joked with people that I was on the CNC diet and that it was so successful. And maybe I'll write a book with that as the catchy title. Uh, but anyway, my single indulgence or I guess uh, most prominent indulgence is this artisan dark chocolate that I source from around the globe and I become a connoisseur. I've learned a lot about it, the production methods, how to source the best stuff. Had a great show with gourmet chocolate maker Sean Askinosi from askinosi.com. Fantastic chocolate, some of the best in the world, and was especially uh taken to learn that the mainstream product that we buy and see in the store at that familiar affordable price point is almost certainly sourced from child slave labor in Africa due to the poorly regulated uh, business of cacao farming, which happens in the equatorial regions of the globe, uh, particularly in Africa that's responsible for most of the production, uh, a big percentage. The rest of it would be in South America with small percentages in Asia, places like Hawaii. Uh, so if you're buying an inexpensive chocolate bar that you found on the shelf 
at a mainstream grocery store, or even sadly at most Whole Foods that I visit, they have the same selection of chocolate bars. Some of them look really healthy and eco-friendly, and 10% of the profits are donated to the rainforest. But you can look on the back of the bar and look at the ingredients, and if you do do not see cacao beans as the first ingredient, this implies that the bar was made with commodity ingredients, so uh, of unknown source or origin, most likely from uh, cheap sources and uh, poorly processed. A lot of times they um, will just uh, indiscriminately harvest the cacao beans, including the rotten ones, and they will burn the crap out of them during the roasting process so that they uh, mask the smell and then dump sugar into the bar, especially if it's lower than 80 percent uh which is what i try to strive as my cutoff and then you're buying sort of this this um this palatable product but you're supporting slave labor and you're not getting the best health benefits so you want to source bean to bar dark chocolates bean to bar designation means that the manufacturer askinosi there in st louis missouri got the beans in the gunny sack shipped from uh, the equatorial area where they source the farmer they know they're getting great quality beans in askinosi's case he gives a share of his corporate profits to the farmers down in south america that he deals with wonderful story so try to be discriminate with your uh, even with your indulgences and all your foods by looking on the carnivore scores food rankings chart and of course uh, going for the big picture items like uh, sourcing uh, grass fed for your beef and um, pasture raised for your eggs and your poultry and so forth. And uh, I'm enjoying my relationship with Butcher Box. You can go on my website uh, for on the recommendations page and uh, you can click on Butcher Box and you get a great introductory offer to add to your basket, your custom design basket that you can order and ship to your house every month or whatever frequency you want. So there's no pressure. Uh, mine gets eaten up every month for sure. And so I'm a huge Butcher Box customer. They source the very best grass fed beef, uh, pasture raised poultry, uh, sustainable fish, heritage breed pork. So if you're looking in the pork category, you want to find that designation heritage breed. Uh, that implies that the pig was raised in more favorable conditions than a feedlot pig. Okay, so that's a lot of commentary getting you up to present day. I should mention that after I uh, achieved my fat reduction goal, uh, I relaxed my commitment to um, both the, the, the carnivore emphasis and especially the fasting until 12 noon, especially putting in the uh, super duper super fuel smoothie that I can't wait to share with you when our product comes to market uh, in the coming months. And it's the ultimate whey protein super fuel infused with other performance agents like creatine, glutamine, uh, just absolutely fantastic centerpiece to my diet and to my performance and recovery and longevity goals. So uh, relaxing that commitment about uh, watching the clock and also allowing whatever other indulgent foods I want to come in, such as the occasional bowl of popcorn for fatty popcorn boy. And um, this is all, I think, in the interest of enjoying my life, right? I don't need to go get a bowl of popcorn for nutritional purposes, <laughs> nor uh, whatever other treats you might find or catch me consuming here and there. Uh, mostly dark chocolate, again, if I had my choice, or, you know, I'm at a family gathering and dessert is presented and I pass uh, because I'd rather just have a few squares of my chocolate with all other things being equal, right? Okay, so um, the, the main purpose here is to enjoy my life and also direct those uh, precious and uh, scarce assets of focus, discipline, and willpower into other areas of my life, like staying away from my email inbox when I'm trying to write a book. Uh, but the current status of Brad's diet, remember that movie, Brad's Status? Yes, there's a movie with Ben Stiller. It's actually pretty good. And believe it or not, it was set in Sacramento. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Anyway, uh, Brad's Status today is this uh, C&C type of dietary pattern where it's carnivore-ish with a lot of gourmet dark chocolate. And I want to do a whole other show uh, with uh, more details on the lasting benefits of my current dietary strategy. So we will hit that with part three. And thank you for listening to this wonderful part two. Again, we appreciate your comments, feedback so much. Podcast at bradventures.com. Go to town and share the show with others. Take care. Ba -ba 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 -ba. It's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. Hey, this is going to be one of my favorite commercials because I get to introduce you to 
the delicious, nutritious, life-changing Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece. This is a mind-blowing nut butter blend that will soon ascend to your number one go-to snack, treat, or accoutrement for anything from dark chocolate, a cucumber celery smear, or mixed in with yogurt, oatmeal, cheesecake, or with a spoon right into your mouth, heading south. Let me, let me, let me tell you what I created in my kitchen through whirlwind experimentation and an extreme sampling to my VIP product testing crew across the nation so far with a hundred percent approval. In this beautiful jar, we have macadamia nuts, walnuts, cashews, the rare and precious coconut butter, coconut flakes, cacao nibs, real ancient sea salt, and organic MCT oil. Every single ingredient has been sourced to origin to be the very best we could find from around the world for the absolute highest purity and nutritional value. We run this product in small batches with a boutique family business in the Pacific Northwest, and everything is cold-pressed to preserve nutritional value. So if you like eating healthy, it's a dream come true for all those who are keto, primal, paleo, and vegan vegetarian too. I come in peace, my global healthy living friends. Masterpiece that is. Try some now and it will change your life. I promise. If you don't like it, send it back to me. I'll eat it. You can order Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece on Amazon. Simple, simple. Or if you're bold, daring, and adventurous, buy three and get a bottle free at bradventures.com. Buy six and we'll send you eight. Christmas shopping early instead of late at bradventures.com. Check it out. Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece. Uh. Thank you for listening to the show. I love sharing the experience with you and greatly appreciate your support. Please email podcast at bradventures.com with feedback, suggestions, and questions for the Q&A shows. Subscribe to our email list at bradkearns.com for a weekly blast about the published episodes and a wonderful bi-monthly newsletter edition with informative articles and practical tips for all aspects of healthy living. You can also download several awesome free ebooks when you subscribe to the email list. And if you could go to the trouble to leave a five or five star review with Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to the shows, that would be super incredibly awesome. It helps raise the profile of the BRAD podcast and attract new listeners. And did you know that you can share a show with a friend or loved one by just hitting a few buttons in your player and firing off a text message? My awesome podcast player called Overcast allows you to actually record a soundbite excerpt from the episode you're listening to and fire it off with a quick text message. Thank you so much for spreading the word. And remember, be rad.